Chapter 8 of The Octave of Claudius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter 8. Downstairs in the study, the two men went on talking, long after Mrs. Lamb had left them. Claudius felt himself to be just a shade above his normal state. The difference was very slight. A feeling of unusual contentment, almost of exultation. Perhaps it was no more than the pleasure that comes in telling of trouble past. Sandell, said the doctor, in some respects I observe that you are a practical man. Claudius laughed. I've never been accused of that before, he said. Do you mean it? Well, perhaps I should have put it that, according to my view, you were practical. The world would think otherwise. It would consider that you should have gone to your friends in London and bothered them to find you work of some sort. It would rebuke you for your foolishness in having written a novel when you ought to have been earning money. It would have asked you why you did not take a post as a master in a private school, or become a cab driver. My wife tells me that you drive well, since either profession would have brought you a certain income. For that matter, said Claudius, they would have bought about the same income. Well, when I come to look back on my life now, I honestly think that the world would be right. Do you? Is life, for mere life's sake, worth living? Could you, for instance, live on in a state of continual humiliation and obligation? Do not forget that I am living in a state of great obligation at this moment. It is true that I will not... There, there. I wasn't referring to that. If it is any comfort to know it, I will give you the chance tonight to end all the obligations, even to place me under an obligation to you. I accept it at once, said Claudius impulsively. No. You must hear about it first. Oh, don't let's bother about it just now. Let me see. I was speaking of life for its own sake. There I entirely agree with what must have been your own belief. Life for its own sake is without value. I do not want it. You reached a point in your career in which you lived for your work alone. Believe me, whatever your future fate may be, you will always look back on that period with a great and legitimate elation. For myself, I always live for my work alone. I also should be elated, only I haven't the time. Besides, my work makes me humble. Your work, Claudius said, is different from mine. It is so much finer. I suppose that my novel is very bad. I have been too close to it, worked too long on it to be able to form any opinion about it myself. Now that it is written, I hardly ever think about it. But if it were good and deserved reward, I should have it. The days of the unappreciated are over. The unseen blush has gone out. I work for myself and get a reward, if I deserve it. You work for humanity at large, regardless of rewards. Pioneers are seldom rewarded, the doctor answered. Ideas don't pay. The improvements on ideas do. And the tinkers are kings nowadays. But I certainly have my reward. You've noticed, perhaps, that only people with imagination lay down wine. The old man in his cellar, storing the vintage that he knows he cannot live to drink, tastes in that moment all its unborn perfections that one day his grandson overhead will praise. The man that plants trees sleeps in imagination under their grateful shade. He began to pace slowly up and down his study. He went on. And I have at least imagination enough to picture the humanity that might be if my own line of research would do all that it promises. Ah, Sandell, it is well enough that we should look backward, from man to the anthropoid ape, from the ape to the original bird or reptile. But to look forward is better. We are not at the end yet. I see, yes, in my mind's eye, I actually see this new humanity. It walks erect, clinging to no mystery. It holds the keys of life or death, 
of heaven and hell. It is the master of its fate, makes its character, molds its physique, has just what intellect it wills, and all that may happen if I will tell it, as I hope to tell it, some two or three things. He opened the window and looked out in the direction of the lights of London. There, he exclaimed, there they are, millions of them, away in the smoke, laughing, sweating, living, dying. Each man of them is nothing as an individual. Charles Peace and William Shakespeare were both accidents. Yet how I am compelled, as by some blind force, to love them in the mass. They don't know where they come from, or whither they go. They have their hopes about it, or their fears, or their complete indifference. But not one of them knows. Not one, echoed Claudius. They don't know their own potentialities, and most of them are half afraid to push the limits of their knowledge. Yes, that is really pathetic, unspeakably pathetic. I should have thought, said Claudius, that the tendency nowadays was the opposite of that, a thirst to find out all that one possibly could. Yes, yes, in certain directions. Not in all? Not for the average man. He believes in his divine genius and his devilish criminal. He does not want to have them explained away. He does not want to find their origin traced otherwise than directly to God or devil. He will let the doctor give him pills for his body, but he believes that his mind and his morals are exclusively in the hands of God and fate. And you do not believe in any of that? At any rate, I substitute very indirectly for directly. If there is any antagonism between religion and science, it is the fault of religion. It will defend untenable positions, and then, when the positions are lost, assert that it was unnecessary to have defended them, as they were immaterial. That kind of thing makes any man angry who loves truth. At the same time, I do not rail against religion. While your raw medical student is making himself objectionable about the doctrine of the Incarnation, I am studying Parthenogenesis. True, I sneered just now at the divinity of genius and the devilishness of the criminal. Neither has the inevitability which belongs to one's idea of a superhuman power. Bring me a genius, and permit me to hit him on the head. If I hit him hard enough, but not too hard, he will not die, but his genius will leave him. His books will remain unwritten, his pictures unpainted. But the reverse process, said Claudius, to make a stupid man intelligent? By the simple operation required for the removal of a post-nasal growth, a stupid child may be made intelligent. The administration of a simple purge may preserve the sanity that a man would otherwise have lost. By the... But why should I quote these commonplaces? You know that the connection between mind and body exists. The connection between fear and the heart, for instance, between hope and the respiratory organs, between anger or melancholy and the digestive apparatus, is as well as the connection between thought and the brain. After all, why should I bother you with the starting points of medical psychology, of my own beliefs and my own line of research? Really, doctor, I am more eager to find out than you are to tell. I want to know how this research is going on, and how it will end. It will go on and end in the service of humanity. If I give you the details, I think that you would regard me rather as a quack than as a doctor, a quack with the restless ambitions of a madman. Yet remember that the heterodoxy of today is the orthodoxy of tomorrow. All the charlatan falsely pretends to do, the man of science sneers at as impossible. But the man of science of the next generation actually does what the charlatan falsely pretends to do. If I have been ambitious, at any rate, I have not been reckless. I have worked. I have won my way step by step. If I was ever tempted to make a theory, and one little fact stood in the path, I have either accounted for the fact or modified the theory, 
or abandoned it altogether. I have proved theories, on the other hand, that I should have never dared to imagine. They have been forced upon me by the chain of facts, theories that have never even been propounded before. As far as I have got, I could write my discoveries on half a sheet of notepaper. But though they may be few, they are vital. I tell you solemnly, Sandell, that the whole future of humanity depends upon them and what will follow them. Will it be long before you reach the end? I cannot say. At present I cannot get on properly. I am in a position of the greatest tantalization and difficulty. If I had not learnt from my work the utmost patience and humility, this tantalization would be enough to drive me mad. I told you how, the other night, I almost forced the gate. That word, almost, it comes in and spoils everything. There is one thing that I want. What is it? I want a man whom I can trust implicitly, who will trust me implicitly. I am at your service, doctor, Claudius answered. I mean it. You said the other day that you knew I did not tell lies. I would keep your secrets. Ah, yes. It is proverbial, of course, that it is better not to show children or fools half-finished work. I should be reluctant to have one of my discoveries known at present, because it could be so easily misused. Still, you must not think that I am the victim of scientific jealousy. Lord, what a lot there is of that! Let me do the work, and get the knowledge, and anyone else may have the glory of it. But you must hear more. Well? Dr. Lamb sat down again, his great hands interlocked, his eyes fixed steadily on Claudius. You must have had your finger on his pulse to know that he was going through critical and exciting moments. Sundell, he said, do you remember that when you sold all your personal property to get enough money to enable you to finish your novel, that you made one offer, ironical, I suppose, which the shopman was foolish enough not to accept? Yes, but my offer was more foolish than his refusal. Your offer was foolish for two reasons. You asked too little. You have probably thirty efficient years before you in the ordinary course of things. The doctor pulled out a pocket pencil and did a rapid sum on his shirt cuff. The entire command of your body and soul must be worth to any man more than thirty-three pounds six pence a year. Even you must see that. You would get more if you simply worked for a few hours a day as a bricklayer's laborer. Then again, you asked for a year in which to spend that money. Yes, too little. Too little, my dear Sandell? It was too much. Very many times too much. Think what may happen in a year. The countless ties that one may form and find it difficult to break. The entire change that may come over one's opinions. The entire alteration in one's views of life. How could you go back at the end of a year? Temptation to break your word would be almost insuperable. Yet, if I had made the senseless arrangement, I should have gone back. You would, but you would have rendered it difficult. Besides, that year, that pleasant holiday, in which you would have said farewell to the world in your own past, should have been characterized by freedom, as far as freedom could possibly be obtained. You said tonight that you had never tasted real freedom. You would certainly not have had it if you had lived for a year on a thousand pounds. You would have found yourself constantly exercising common care to avoid a pecuniary indiscretion. In that last holiday of your life, you should have no common care, at any rate, no thought of money. Yes, it sounds reasonable. It always interests me to discuss imaginary conditions of life, the moon life of which we were speaking at dinner, for instance. Sandell, said the doctor seriously, the conditions which we are discussing now need not be imaginary. I told you that I wanted a man who would trust me implicitly. I want a man who will trust me so far that he will make over to me, asking no questions, the remainder of his life for the consideration eight thousand pounds, 
that I am prepared to offer. He must come to me as he would come to death itself, putting his past behind him and away from him, giving up himself, body and soul, to me. Twice recently have I found a man who would have been willing to have placed that trust in me. But in neither case could I have trusted the man. Sooner or later he would have gone back on his bargain, and of course the law would not have helped me. But I trust you. If you give me your word of honor, I do not want other security. I do not offer you more than you are worth to me. Indeed, I am not wealthy enough to offer you as much as you are worth. You would leave me under an obligation. I offer eight thousand pounds, and I give you eight days. Are you really meaning this? Yes. I am to ask no questions about the future. It would be better not. For your own sake, it would be better that the eight days of holiday and farewell should be without anticipations, that you should be able to shut the future out of your mind, and for my sake you must place yourself in my position. You know it, at any rate, shows me that you place the same confidence in me that I do in you. Perhaps it is for that reason I ask it. Remember that I risk eight thousand pounds on your word alone. True. Why eight days? And I could not possibly take the money. On that point you must let me decide. The money is not too much. A thousand pounds a day will make it unnecessary for you to exercise common care. Besides, it will be a satisfaction to me to feel that I have paid it. In eight days, you will not have time to form new ties, or make new opinions. Only time to taste freedom for once in your life, to enjoy deeply, and yet not to that pitch of nausea which comes to those who follow enjoyment for a long period to say farewell in happiness, instead of saying it, as you would have done on the night that I found you, in abject misery. For me, the eighth days is too long. I am impatient for, for your cooperation. Eight days, the octave that the church gives to its saints, do not ask for more. Well, if I refuse, is there no other way by which I can repay my obligations to you? Oh, why speak of them? If you refuse, there is an end of it. And I am charmed to have been able to give my medical advice and my poor hospitality to such a good fellow as yourself. That is all. That ends it, so far as you are concerned. Of course, there remains for myself a considerable disappointment. The doctor's voice was careless. His expression was one of geniality and generosity. It is a tremendous thing, said Claudius slowly. Yet I do not see why I should refuse. As you say, you found me when, if you had not found me, I should have died, probably. I really speak the truth without affectation, when I tell you that I was perfectly ready and willing to have died then. Very little has changed since. I have been away from all friends for so long that I have got used to doing without them. I am still cut off from my father and my home. I have never been in love in my life. I am alone in the world. If I gave my mind to it now, I would probably make a livelihood, enough to give me bare life, without the things in it that I should like. But possibly I couldn't. If I could, I should be serving no good end. If I come to you, you use me as you use yourself for the service of man. I have no scientific training, and I do not see how I can help you. But you know that. What you say suggests to me that you may require my assistance in some... Well, you know, doctor, it is inevitable that in your research there should be experiments. And I dare say some of them are singularly repulsive. You may require from me good nerves, laboriousness so great that it takes no account of health, and complete secrecy and devotion rather than scientific attainments. I do not see why I should not leave these things to you. I have myself had some experience of your unusual knowledge. The rapidity with which I recovered my strength under your treatment was almost miraculous. Still more have I reason to trust your kindness and humanity. 
it is not merely the material kindness that i have had from you i think under difficult circumstances you have shown more delicate regard for the feelings of a foolishly sensitive man than ever i experienced before you showed no trace of even unkindliness when i spoke of refusing your offer proving if proof had been wanted that your generosity was spontaneous without a second motive claudius was not looking at dr lamb at this moment the doctor half closed his eyes and smiled slightly there was a short pause claudius sat with his eyes fixed on one point of the carpet then he drew a long breath and said i put the responsibility for myself in your hands doctor i accept i will take my eight days of freedom and then come back to you you understand that you give me your word of honor said the doctor and that the arrangement once made will not be revoked it will be terminated only by your own death or mine yes a deep-toned clock struck the hour of midnight the doctor stretched himself picked up a cigarette and lit it extraordinary thing sandell he said the difficulty that two men have who are not used to business experience in concluding a money bargain with each other they shirk it and get awkward in their manner and clumsy in their speech well it's over i'm glad of it the day's over too said claudius glancing at the clock personally i'm not sleepy but it seems to me that i must be keeping you either from your work or your sleep from neither i assure you the day was made for working and the night was made for talking whenever one wants to talk if you care to discuss the details by all means let us do it well doctor said claudius there is very little to say i shall spend the eight days in london probably when would you like them to begin now said the doctor laughing of course i don't mean that let me see tomorrow's no today's friday that's the worst of sitting up past midnight tomorrow becomes today which is damnably confusing i really don't see why you shouldn't leave me at midnight on friday returning consequently at midnight on saturday eight days afterwards then you begin your new career with a new week one's always despicably hungry to secure these dirty little coincidences both men laughed i should like of course claudius said to see my friends again in london in these eight days the two or three friends that i have there true i didn't see them when i might have done so i felt too poor to see anybody which now i come to think of it was vulgar of me but still friends are friends besides how can i say farewell unless i have someone to say it to and my father decides that i have already said it as far as he is concerned by all means see your friends the doctor replied cheerfully have as good a time as you possibly can remember that for eight days you are absolutely free in the morning francis shall go into london for us he will take the necessary letter to my banker for me and he will do anything for you that you want secure you the best rooms in the best hotel take letters to your friends and bring back their answers order your box at the opera carry out any commission you like thanks very much a thousand pounds a day it is tremendous what couldn't one do with it let us hope that you won't find out the answer to that question sandell the doctor went on we are neither of us drinking anything the formal necessary unpretentious whiskey and seltzer is here but it doesn't seem to me to be suited to the occasion i may be old but i am young enough to want to drink champagne now the servants are all in bed but no matter where are my keys ah here it is a wise man that knows his own cellar don't you trouble to come i'll find what i want he was back in a minute or two with the bottle in his hand the last he said the very last of a wine that i have reverenced with deft fingers he began to uncork it both men had for some unexplained midnight reason got into the highest spirits and they jested like boys over the operation the doctor filled two tumblers handed one to claudius and raised his own 
success to your eight days he cried success to the octave end of chapter eight chapter nine of the octave of claudius this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter 9. Claudius breakfasted late and alone on Friday morning. The doctor had breakfasted long before, and Mrs. Lamb did not leave her room. The doctor excused her on the ground of ill health, and said that when Claudius returned, they would probably be leaving England. She needs a change. After breakfast, Claudius wrote two notes one to burnage and another to lady verrider francis was to take them to town and bring back answers he was also to execute various other commissions for claudius and make the necessary arrangements at the bank dr lamb was much more fertile than claudius in suggesting what might be done the doctor had a keen appreciation for the various luxuries and pleasures that eight thousand pounds would procure to Claudius, the chief point was that the eight thousand pounds would free him from the necessity for thinking about pounds at all. He did not want nearly so much money, but the doctor insisted, and only by this arrangement, carried out exactly as the doctor proposed it, would he be allowed to free himself of his obligations. The doctor had told him very little, and it was useless for him to make conjectures. Possibly he had done a very foolish thing, but there had seemed to be nothing else before him. It was just before dinner that Francis returned from London. He brought back with him two notes for Claudius. The first was from Henry Burnage. It contained this passage. Of course I shall be delighted to lunch with you at your hotel tomorrow. I need not inquire after the material prosperity of any one who can afford to patronize such a place, and I am glad to think that all goes well with you. But why have you hidden yourself like this for so long? It was such an exceedingly bad thing to do that there is probably a woman at the bottom of it. And why are you leaving England? But we can talk about that tomorrow. Yes, I still write. My work is not of a class that could be called popular, nor should I wish it to be. I am writing a series entitled Inward Incidents, every week, in a new journal called The Latest Light. They are impressions of some emotional experiences in the life of a young and sensuous girl. I will bring you a number or two to see, but I dare say you won't make much of them. Are you married or engaged or anything, you ask? No, my dear Sandal, art is my only mistress. It is unaccountable to me, and I do not say it out of any spirit of boasting, but the fact is that I seem to have a horrible gift of seeing right through every woman I meet, an absolute incapacity for being illusionized. The wonder to me is that every other man does not show a similar incapacity, but they do not. Poor Luke Monset you remember him, has just engaged himself to his principal's daughter. It is perhaps unnecessary to add that Henry Burnage had carried out his intention and proposed to Angela Witcherly, and that Angela had, in the kindest and most considerate way, refused him. It had been a great sorrow to Mrs. Witcherly, but her husband, who was not without shrewdness, had quite approved of the refusal. The other letter was briefer. It was from old Lady Verrider. My good Claudius, I've half a mind never to speak to you again. I've quarrelled with your father about you, and by way of showing your gratitude, you leave me severely alone for over a year. Well, you always were erratic, and honestly, I shall be very glad to see you again. Young men always do as they like. Now, I am going to be at home to you on Saturday afternoon, if you will come and have a talk and account for yourself a little, and in any case you must dine with me on Saturday night. You shall take into dinner a good and sufficient reason for changing your mind about leaving England, 
i've recently discovered her and love her and her name's angela always your friend jane verider claudius saw but little of the doctor during the day he had been busy in his laboratory but shortly before dinner he came into the library where claudius was reading your carriage will come for you at twelve precisely tonight he said you forgot to tell francis when you wanted it and so i took the liberty you see i am not going to let you off one single minute of your imprisonment here at twelve exactly the octave begins imprisonment said claudius good heavens what a word for it why didn't you let me go to town to-day instead of francis i've been dying for want of occupation except when i was driving your bay mare and then i pretty nearly died for other reasons you'd better sell her before she kills somebody i shall be selling all three horses before i leave england you couldn't have gone to town anyhow you haven't the genius that francis has for doing a whole lot of uninteresting things in the quickest and most practical way without forgetting any of them i'm afraid though you've been having a rather solitary time of it i was at a point in my work when i simply couldn't leave it and my wife oh i hope she's better tonight she says she is she will dine with us the doctor's shaggy eyebrows contracted a little a curious case he said almost as if he were speaking to himself a very curious case claudius did not like to hear the doctor speak of his wife as a case he had a vague idea that to doctors all sick persons were cases but this seemed to be in bad taste he changed the subject doctor he said francis brought me back from town a note from a man called burnage whom i used to know at cambridge i won't say that he was an absolutely intimate friend of mine but certainly i thought i knew him fairly well i wrote to ask him to lunch with me tomorrow a half chafing letter well he sends me back a long and serious reply the most preposterous stuff and it puzzles me has burnage changed altogether since i knew him at cambridge or have i both said dr lamb as far as character is concerned it is pretty certain that the boy is not father to the man it was the ambition of my life at one time to be an evangelical preacher i fainted on the first occasion when i went into a dissecting room and i wrote a letter attacking vivisection to an evening paper i fell in love several times and i certainly wanted to make money do you mean to tell me that the man who did these things is the man who speaks now of course not is the girl who flutters under a first kiss the same as the wearisome mammal who's the mother of your seventh of course not that sounds brutal but this man burnage he wasn't particularly popular at cambridge he went in for despising athletics which was a stupid kind of thing to do but he wouldn't have written that letter then he went in for being distinctly the man of taste certainly corrupto optimi pessima carry precision in literary style too far and you may get the precious and emasculated carry truth too far and as you observe you may get brutality the worst possible taste is the result of an attempt to grow the best possible taste from anything but the best possible feeling i don't fancy that the belief in the change of individuality could be carried to its logical conclusions said claudius for instance now doctor when i was a boy of fourteen i in company with another boy surreptitiously procured a bottle of whisky we put a lot of sugar into it to make it more palatable and even then we didn't like it and of course we had no previous experience with spirits however we both of us got completely drunk we weren't discovered as it happened but we suffered punishment for all that well i laugh about this and yet for the life of me i can't help feeling ashamed of it the boy that got so badly intoxicated on cheap whisky wasn't the man i am now 
then why should I feel ashamed of his notions? Why, indeed? To me it seems that it is no more logical to be ashamed of one's past than to be ashamed of one's waste tissues. Be ashamed of your present if you like, but what has the past got to do with you? You are illogical because you are influenced by a long-formed habit. Habits of thought are just as hard to break off as other habits. After all, said Claudius, it's only a question of a point of view. The illogicality does no actual harm. In your case, probably not. But take our method of dealing with the criminal. We tie him tight down to his past, and we do our best to destroy his self-respect, which is the most important factor in the production of self-improvement. In fact, if we can make the man heartily ashamed of himself, we call him penitent, and we are very glad. When we do those things, we say that we are repressing crime or punishing crime. As a matter of fact, we are making crime. One night, a clerk, in the ordinary way a respectable clerk, allows the utter pig within him to come uppermost. There may perhaps be some exceptional combination of temptation and opportunity. Well, the utter pig is so outrageous that the man is imprisoned. His name is in all the papers. When he comes out, he finds not only that his self-respect is gone, but that the conditions of his life have been so altered that it is more difficult for him to get work and be decent and upright. Of course, it should be much more easy. Equally, of course, the man's self-respect should be strengthened in every possible way. That's all very well, Doctor, but what about the habitual criminal? Would it be of any use to take the habitual criminal, slap him on the back, tell him that there was plenty of good in him after all, and put him into a position of trust? Possibly not. I was not speaking of the habitual criminal. When the criminal has really ceased to be responsible, as in the case of some of the habitual female drunkards that you come across in the police reports, I think medical treatment might be good occasionally. And in cases where medicinal treatment could do nothing, obviously the really moral and humane thing is to kill the criminal. No one would hear of it. No one ever will hear of the obviously right thing to do. They mistrust it just because it's obvious. So we kill the man who has committed one murder. Often he is a man of talent and activity, with strong potentialities for good a man who might do his part towards human happiness and human improvement. But we let the confirmed sot live and breed more sots. Remember, too, that it is under your penal system that the hardened criminal occurs, and that method which you considered ridiculous has at any rate never been tried. Would you try it? Oh, no. It's not much less ridiculous than you think it. It would succeed in a greater percentage of cases than you suppose, but even then the percentage would be very small. It is wrong because it is working at the wrong end. It is dealing with effect instead of cause, and that kind of mistake is a good deal more common than you would suppose. Even Darwin popularly supposed to be the exponent of a belief that man sprang from the monkey. Curious, all these popular suppositions are made the same kind of mistake in a different use. In the question of sex difference, he substitutes a teleological for an etiological explanation. Ah, said Claudius, laughing, it's just as well that we've got to get up and dress. You're taking me too deep. Deep? Good heavens, man, we aren't even paddling. Your education, pardon me, was too one-sided. It gave you much that I would like to have, and have not, but it was the kind of education which could let you hold a popular and imperfect notion of Darwinism, and could let you be ignorant how far the theories of Darwin have since been modified or corrected. And you think that a mission very important? Well, yes, for certain reasons, but we will discuss them after dinner. Subsequently, Claudius found Mrs. Lamb in the drawing-room, she was wearing some fine diamonds. They were quite out of place, of course. The doctor raised his thick eyebrows. Yes, it was so. Of taste and tact, she had very little. Yet the greater things, 
the things that lie at the back of life, the things that we try to put away because they are too serious seemed sometimes to rise and at once to claim her for their own, and to justify her. Twice that night she surprised Claudius. At dinner, in the course of ordinary talk, quite suddenly and quite calmly, she made a remark that was worse than irreligious. It was virulently blasphemous. It did not involve the use of any word that a decent woman could not use, but for all that it was indescribably shocking, even to the two men who were neither of them orthodox, the more shocking because it was so utterly unexpected. Claudius was staggered. For a moment he hardly knew what was happening, and then he became conscious that the doctor was talking to him about steamrollers, and at the same time looking at Mrs. Lamb, and that Mrs. Lamb seemed nervous and half frightened. For the rest of dinner she was almost entirely silent. She seemed to avoid her husband's glance. Her eyes looked hard and dry. After dinner she excused herself to Claudius on the ground of her health. She felt tired and must go back to her room. Certainly she looked very pale. Claudius opened the door for her. The doctor stood at the dining table some distance away, absorbed in the choice of a cigar. "'You have chosen a queer time for leaving us,' she said. "'You should have stopped and driven over to London in the morning. "'However, good-bye.' "'She said it without the least trace of excitement. "'He took her hand. "'Don't let us all call it good-bye. "'I am coming back. "'I must have another opportunity to thank you for all of your kindness to me. "'It is au revoir, Mrs. Lamb.' "'She laughed said that she was not to be thanked at all, and passed into the hall. Claudius shut the door, and then noticed Mrs. Lamb's handkerchief lying on the floor. He picked it up and opened the door again to give it to her. As he did so, she called from halfway up the stairs. "'Have I dropped my handkerchief, Mr. Sandal?' "'Yes,' he said, "'and I shall bring it to you. "'Don't trouble to come down.' He went up and handed it to her. Without a word of thanks, she clutched his arm and said in a low, rapid voice, "'Listen quickly. You must not come back. For my own sake, for yours. I warned you before, and you wouldn't believe me. It's a matter of life and death.' "'I'm sorry,' said Claudius. "'But I must not discuss it at all. The doctor wants me, and I have given my word of honour. I shall do all I can to prevent your return. I've had ideas. But Gabriel used to say my day was coming, and I know now what he meant. It may come before I can carry the ideas out, and if I fail, you must break your word. Ah, if I only had time to tell you, it would be less wrong to break your word. No, no, said Claudius gently, withdrawing his arm. You must not think about that, Mrs. Lamb. Everything will be all right. You need have no fear. Good night again. She put one hand to her throat for a second, and seemed to be trying to speak again, but she said nothing. She turned and ran upstairs. "'Poor lady,' said Claudius to himself. She was, he felt sure now, far more ill than he had supposed. She had evidently not known what she was saying. In the dining-room he found the doctor, leaning back in his chair, smoking placidly. "'Sandal!' he said. There are two alternatives between which every night after dinner I find it difficult to choose. If I perform a simple amputation of the end of my cigar, I find that the draught is good, but that the leaf unrolls. If, on the other hand, I make a wedge-shaped incision at a distance of one-eighth of an inch from the end, the leaf does not unroll, but the draught is less satisfactory. What am I to do? What do you do? Well, said Claudius, I've tried both ways, and I've always found both of them answer perfectly. But if your cigars won't work, why don't you try a pipe? Sublime in its simplicity. I will. It's only my own method with the irreclaimable criminal adapted. Have some more wine? No? Then let's go to the study out of the smell of the mutton. In the study, the doctor suddenly changed his tone. Sandal, he said nervously. I've been thinking it over, and I've have an uneasy feeling that I've been taking advantage of you in this business. I hurried you. I rushed it too much. No, said Sandal. 
when i spoke i spoke deliberately the chances of my book are i am persuaded worth nothing as a schoolmaster or a secretary i might have scraped up enough to repay you what you have spent upon me but there would still be much of another kind that could not be repaid and i have some doubt whether i could stand the life doctor i'm sick of pettiness and struggling i had so much of it in the months before you found me and i'm equally sick of working for merely selfish and ignoble reasons let me be some good to somebody the work that you do is great and if i can help you at all in it i ask nothing better no my one objection is that i do not in the least want eight thousand pounds no more of that said the doctor see here i don't want reputation i only want to get the knowledge but the reputation will come and you will not share it money too will come though i shall take no steps to acquire it you will not have any of it you are merely taking your share in advance and you must see your own point of view the law does not recognize any such arrangement as we have made together by the law i am wrong but there are grades in wrongness and if i did not carry out my side of that arrangement i should be more wrong if i allowed you to give yourself to me and gave you nothing in return i should stand condemned by my own moral sense curious thing my own moral sense is owing to my disregard of individuals it is never affected by any personal bias and it is always perfectly just it will let me use any means however wrong that are requisite for the great end that i have in view but it will not let me use means that are more wrong than is really requisite i don't ask or expect you to listen to this of course if any man talked to me after dinner about his moral sense i'd go to sleep under his very eyes and tell him afterwards why i did it but oh i'm not going to sleep very well then we let things stand just as we arranged last night i was more or less in a hurry said the doctor and consequently i hurried you but there is some excuse for me when you first came here my wife was for her unusually well she well you saw for yourself to-night i must get her abroad as soon as possible and yes yes i understand said claudius they fell to chatting of other subjects the doctor was as usual sometimes enthusiastic sometimes bitter and sometimes blasphemous and sometimes showed the clearest judgment and sense he began by saying how glad he was that claudius had friends in london who would help him to enjoy his eight days otherwise you'd have died of ennui one can enjoy nothing alone except solitude and now i come to think of it said claudius i suppose i must make rather a point of not dying to die intentionally the doctor said smiling would of course be fraudulent otherwise your death would merely end the bargain i take the risk of that just as i take the risk of my own death by the way death isn't altogether uninteresting what is death doctor good heavens man if i could define it i should know enough about it to avoid it forever to be out of harmony with one's environment is to die if you can stand a definition that tells nothing and means nothing death is the price we pay for being multicellular that's rather better the happy protozoan with his single cell never dies never at any rate by natural death the strength of wind blows down the tower but does not damage the single brick yes said claudius rather impatiently that accounts for the body looks at the mechanical side one knows all that our bodies are rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees but i have a personality feel sure of it what becomes of that the doctor altered the position of the lamp and spread out the fingers of his great hand you observe he said the shadow of my hand on the wall i take away the hand the shadow goes that's the second analogy i've used to-night and i might as well be a curate however no matter take away the body and the personality goes we find them always together not connected but simultaneous is it unreasonable to suppose that if the body breaks up the personality suffers some similar dispersion and he added with sudden passion is there the least comfort the least satisfaction in finding that the conclusion or any other conclusion is not unreasonably to suppose damn it man why do you take me on to the subject of my greatest difficulties 
the questions that you ask are just the questions that you may ultimately help me to answer the thing that most surprises me in man is his lethargic contented ignorance about some essential points he has been here so long and he does not yet know how he gets here how he goes or how to influence with how to influence with certainty and to a really appreciable extent his moral character or his intellectual abilities there are moments when he cares and gets very nervous but as a rule he is quite comfortable sits before the fire reads the daily papers and says he is master of his fate master of his fate indeed never was there a more astounding and audacious lie yes he said at another point in the conversation later in the evening that is put in a few words the aim of my work to make the man master of his fate ah sandal i've been ordinary enough i've loved a woman i loved my child and my child died i have had delight out of good books and good wine i felt fear envy sorrow hate gone through every experience which could show that i do not transcend humanity but my work is not ordinary it is on a higher plane the time has come for man to hasten his own evolution for the slow crude modifications of nature he must substitute his own thought his own researches he must put truth into the boast that he is master of his fate doctor said sandal you told me once that you believed in god without giving any definition do you believe in the will of god the phrase dr lamb answered frowning slightly is anthropomorphic to ascribe will to god is to ascribe a limitation which except to a theologian with his talk of the self-conditioned must seem futile well put it in other words do you believe that there is something which you cannot thwart i dislike the word thwart interrupted the doctor i believe that there is a tendency which man can neither retard nor accelerate ah said claudius now a moment ago you said that the time had come for man to hasten his evolution i am not illogical the time has come the tendency is here thanks to the primitive instincts of reproduction and self-preservation we have arrived slowly at what we are thanks to the evolved mind of man we shall arrive more quickly at what we shall be evolution itself has provided that which will accelerate evolution the tendency is not accelerated by man but by itself acting through man i see what you mean but how will it happen if i said that i myself was the point of the new departure you would probably consider me a megalomaniac but then you are not yet in possession of the facts possibly i may only live to see the bare commencement of the results of my own work if even that but i trust i shall not die until i am assured that those results must ultimately follow is there any satisfaction to be got out of being the slave of a tendency can one be said to be the slave of a master that is doing all that the slave wishes the tendency is but part of the manifestation of god and to the man of science in my position the love of god has passed from a religious duty into a logical necessity god so far as god is revealed by our knowledge of nature is taking man to the heaven where he would be sandal you've often thought me brutal and once said so it is because i do not regard the individual but the race and what the race may ultimately be but think whether my view or yours is most in accord with the laws of nature the manifestation if you like the term of the will of god it is on the just and the unjust alike that the sun shines or the tower of siloam falls there is no regard there of the individual a moment ago you spoke of your personality as though it were so precious a thing that you could not bear to lose it no i am not sneering at you the instinct for self-preservation is almost universal but do not let it make you lose sense of proportion read a manual of astronomy read darwin we all crib his facts even when we correct his theories familiarize yourself with great tendencies great members great space you may still believe that you are something but to give that up when your time comes will seem to you in a delightful obedience that is no slavery to be far better the doctor who had paced up and down the room as he was talking now seated himself facing the fireplace he had seemed to speak with sincerity enthusiasm almost excitement but with him excitement did not slowly die 
it vanished like a flame blown out. As he filled another pipe, he remarked in a matter-of-fact way, Look here, Sandal, if you write me a check for fifty with tomorrow's date, I'll cash it for you now. You may want small sums tomorrow before it is convenient for you to change a check. Thank you, said Claudius. He did not quite seem to be hearing and understanding. However, he wrote the check, took the notes and thrust them into a pocket, and thanked the doctor again. For a few moments there was silence, and then Claudius said, "'And I'm going away to spend eight thousand pounds, or as much of it as I can, in eight days. I feel like a Bibulon's coaster, who has come into a little money and means to go on the burst with it. You will do in your way what he would do in his, but the ways are widely different. Don't frighten yourself with phrases. Enjoy, enjoy.' Before Claudius could answer, Francis opened the door. Mr. Sandal's carriage is here. Both men glanced at the clock. It was five minutes to twelve. As Francis shut the door, the doctor said, Don't be impatient. You have tried to earn what you are now going to have, but you have failed. I know the feeling that you are going through, but remember, you will earn fully afterwards all the enjoyment that eight days can bring you. Ah! You will do far more than that. Words cannot express the obligation under which I shall be to you, or the delight which I feel in having found you. They had passed into the hall as the doctor talked. Claudius smiled drearily. How do you know that I shall come back? You must have me watched. I know it because you have truth and courage. You will not be watched, of course. The greater your freedom and the law will not recognize our contract. The more such a man as you will feel bound. For a minute or two they chatted. The clock had begun to strike the hour as they shook hands, and Francis opened the carriage door. The doctor waved his hand as Claudius stepped into the carriage. Au revoir, Sandal. Saturday after next, at the same hour, hope you will have a good time. I'll give your message to my wife. The carriage drove off. In the window above the entrance doors there was a light. It was the window of the room that had been the nursery. The blind was held back a little. Mrs. Lamb was watching the lights of the carriage passing down the drive. As the carriage turned onto the road, Claudius thought he heard a cry. The coachman must also have heard it, for he almost pulled up his horses, and then, probably with a reflection that, after all, it was none of his business, drove on again. The doctor, standing alone in the hall, heard that cry very distinctly. It was the scream of a hysterical woman, and it came from the room overhead. He wrinkled his brow a little, and his lips drew back, showing his great white teeth. He crossed the hall and took down a light riding whip. Then he went slowly upstairs, humming to himself. He opened the door of the nursery. On a chest of drawers stood a couple of lighted candles, in tall candlesticks that Mrs. Lamb had brought from her own room. On the floor against the window she lay face upwards, chuckling, panting, sobbing, occasionally speaking incoherently. Gabriel Lamb closed the door behind him. "'Get up,' he said curtly. "'No, no,' she moaned. "'Don't come near me, Gabriel. Don't touch me!' In four quick steps he had crossed the room and was by her side. She began to scream again. He dragged her to her feet, and as she went staggering away from him with arms widespread, he struck her savagely across the back again, and again with the whip. The immediate effect of this brutality was that the hysterical fit stopped suddenly. She reached the mantelpiece and stood clutching it, and facing her husband, her bosom rose and fell quickly and deeply, with anguish in her eyes. But her self-control had partly returned, and when she spoke it was in a subdued voice. Why, why have you done this awful thing? For two reasons. When you come to think over it, you will see that you know them both. She could think of nothing. The blows that he had given her stung and throbbed. From sheer physical pain she began to cry quietly. Oh, Gabriel, you have hurt me so. You have hurt me so. You had better go to bed now, he opened the door for her. I will put the lights out here. Be careful not to drop your handkerchief as you go out this time. Without another word she went into her room. The doctor went downstairs through his study and into the laboratory. He switched on the electric light, flung the riding whip into a corner, and began work. End of chapter 9 Recording by Rich Burgess
Chapter 10 of The Octave of Claudius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter 10. As Claudius dressed for the dinner at Lady Verrider's on the following night, he felt that, so far, he had had a pleasant day. He had breakfasted late, had had a delightful ride in the park, an amusing luncheon with Burnage, and a friendly talk afterwards with Lady Verrider at her house, and had just left her in time to dress and return to dinner. It did occur to him once that it was not perhaps worth while to barter the rest of his life for eight such days, but it still had been pleasant enough. Burnage had been full of questions at first, and Claudius had evaded them. Burnage did not press his inquiries, for a chance was offered him of talking about himself, and he could not bear to miss it. He apologized at intervals for egotism. He referred rather slightly to his varsity days. One is so young, you know, when one is young, he said. He was fond of saying that kind of thing. It was not difficult. He knew that if he only adopted the form of the epigram a humble and stupid world would always give him credit for the point of it finally at the request of claudius he read out one or two of the inward incidents those passages in the life of a young and sensuous girl if claudius had taken them seriously he would have been of the opinion that burnage must have lived a very moral life but have been afflicted with a very indecent imagination but he did not take them seriously he chafed him good-naturedly about them and regarded them as evidence of merely a passing phase burnage served to remind claudius of the good times he had had at cambridge and merely for that claudius was grateful to him burnage's irrepressible superiority was not to be overcome by good-natured chaff my dear fellow he said you have given me an excellent luncheon the wine has been beyond reproach. Consequently, I am sorry to have to be rude to you, but fear that you are a sojourner in the land of Gath. You have told me that you don't like my cigarettes. They're quite perfect. It's only by the greatest... Well, the Turkish ambassador happens to. However, I needn't go into that. The dislike of those cigarettes is a mark. Then there is the way in which you receive my little inward incidents. You don't understand them. You have gone backward. At Cambridge, I remember you used to think about writing, to take an interest in literature. Now, if you wrote at all, you would turn out, let me see, a novel with a plot to it, with adventures in it. Claudius chuckled. That's exactly what I have done, he said. Ah, where is it? To tell you the truth, I exactly know, but don't in the least care. Then you can have given no trouble to it. I gave too much, and that's why I want to forget it. Please. Well, doing anything tonight? Yes, dining out. I was to have dined tonight at Lady Verrider's, but I had to send an excuse the other day. I happened to find out that, well, it's nothing of importance, but a girl's dining there who ought not to meet me. Why not? It isn't as if you talked as you wrote. You misunderstand. Poor little thing. Pretty, too, in her way. It would hardly be fair to tell you more. And besides, it's nothing, I say. In the afternoon, Lady Verrider had been a little puzzled by Claudius. He had been charming to her as ever. His looks, she thought, had improved as they had passed from boyishness to manliness. Most faces, she noticed, coarsened in the process or else became effeminate. But there had been a certain reserve. He had not told her all she had expected. He had explained freely his long absence from her house. He had wanted to give himself up entirely to his work, and he had, besides, been too poor to see anyone. It was with reference to the future that he was so reticent. Where was he going to when he left England? With whom was he going? What would he do, if anything, when he went abroad? He would, he told her, earn the money which he was now spending. For the rest, he was afraid that his future was not his own secret, and that therefore it must remain a secret. Entangled, cried Lady Verrider. A woman! I see it all! No, said Claudius, there is no woman in the case at all. It's almost a matter of business. 
be as kind to me as you always are and don't ask me any more about it or mention to anybody that there is any mystery it's embarrassing i can't be mysterious i couldn't look the part yes you could do and always did lady verrider answered snappishly however young men always have their own way i've known that for a long time unless of course you marry her mm, yes angela i beg your pardon i said angela oh it's lucky that you're coming here to dine to-night a man dropped out two days ago and you've got his place otherwise there might not have been as far as you're concerned any angela at all she's your reason for not leaving england as i told you in my letter might we hear more claudius asked the father's invisible and the mother ought to be no that's sheer spite and worldliness the mother's a good mother with social aspirations i believe they're chiefly for the daughter's sake and that as soon as she's married the aspirations will be folded up and put away and the poor old lady will go to bed tired looks as if she's dressed too youthfully and always had done even in her cradle homeopath i fancy takes pills anyhow but quite a good heart and if you had not set aside all spite and worldliness said claudius how would you have described her then my dear claudius haven't i said that she's got a good heart claudius smiled when it comes to mentioning that but however with regard to angela lady verrida's grey eyes lit up with enthusiasm a wayward lamb eyelashes so wrong and sweet and rather discontented and good oh i can't describe her ah said claudius i've not deserved these treasures i am an outcast lady verrida sighed if only i could be anything half as romantic as that but no i simply must not talk about your dear father temper upsets me in his last letter he said that he utterly absolutely and altogether declined to receive any further communication from me think of it i recognize the idiom said claudius then you've no recent news i suppose fairly recent but there's no change that comey woman has a cottage in your father's place now the spiritualistic business goes on i got that by the way from my maid whose cousin is in service there i didn't ask her anything of course but sometimes one has to give her the run of her tongue lady verrider's husband had been long dead at her dinners her brother acted as host if he was in london he was a dried-up little man who drank water during dinner and one glass of claret afterwards he knew nothing about horses something about men and quite a great deal about women so he liked best to talk about horses at any rate in the first stage of acquaintanceship in the last stage there were with him about sixteen of them you would perhaps find out that he had lived much abroad fought three duels killed one man and regretted exceedingly that he had not killed the other two he was good-tempered rather absent-minded and lived chiefly at his club he's a nice little man geoffrey lady verrider used to say and kind and obliging to me though we don't know each other very well lady verrider looked brilliant that night she could no longer be beautiful as in her youth but she had such pearls and old lace as can be had for money and always seemed more dignified than she felt don't hurry away to-night she murmured as she shook hands with claudius otherwise i shan't have a chance of seeing you one never sees anybody in one's own house if there's anyone else there with this enigmatical utterance she turned to shake hands with a member of parliament who believed that he had rescued her from a bore everybody who shook hands with lady verrider at once believed that he had done something great and right geoffrey severn emerged from behind a palm to greet claudius delighted to meet you again old man he said saw you in the park this morning on the top of a horse you were in the distance or i'd have saluted you before going abroad i hear well well you'll get tired of it i did at least i think i did at any rate i came back to england and mind you do the same and by the way you're taking miss wycherley if you would know her come along then silhouetted against a shaded lamp claudius saw the face of a young girl 
She turned as Geoffrey spoke to her, presenting Claudius. She smiled prettily, but as the smile died away, her eyes looked rather sad. She was the image of sweet discontent. There had certainly been some fog that evening. The real question was whether it would or would not become any worse. He thought and said with due gravity that he feared it would. She half opened her fan and looked down at it, caressingly. Then she said a little shyly that she hoped it wouldn't. We're going out of the land of fogs on Monday, she added, as he gave her his arm. Mamma and I are going down into the country. Really? So am I, he said. But can you bear to part with London in the season? We shan't be there for more than a few days. Do you know Guildbridge at all? Yes, very well. Here are our places. Why must one always go to the wrong side first? You don't mean to tell me that it's to Guildbridge that you're going? Yes, rather humbly. Do you mind? It's a coincidence, because I happen to be going there myself. Still, there's plenty of room, isn't there? I hoped you wouldn't mind. You see, we've taken our rooms there now, and I don't think we can afford. Their eyes met and understood. They both laughed. Don't you think, Claudius said, that you're being a little severe? Then, she answered, somewhat inconsequentially, why did you say that I couldn't bear to part with London in the season? Do I look merely worldly? Has somebody traduced me? I believe, he said seriously, that I asked the question for much the same reason that I feared the fog was getting worse. It's a humiliating confession to have to make. As for the rest, no one has traduced you. Lady Verrider adores you and spoke of you to me. You don't look merely worldly. She drew a long breath. Ah, please say that last part of that again, slowly. As for the rest, no one has. No, go on after. You don't look merely worldly. And say some more. You don't look merely worldly. You look... But I'm afraid I've known you long enough to say that. Let me see, she said meditatively. How long have you known me? Either five minutes or five hundred years. Well, with conscious audacity, make it years then. In that case, I may say that you look like, like your first name, grown a little tired of paradise. Oh, stop! You must go back at once, away with those years. You've only known me minutes, just three minutes, Mr. Sandal. Pardon me, Miss Witcherly, but it must be at least six, probably more. You observe that we are eating salmon. Angela laughed. What a nice idea to measure time by the menu. Now observe, when it's a half past the caramel pudding, we may possibly speak about myself again. Until then, no. You've been to the Academy, of course? Certainly not. A great theatre-goer? Hardly ever. Come soon, soon, caramel pudding. You ought not to say that. Here's another chance for you. The lady in black satin is my mamma, and Lady Verida's a dear, too. But you can say anything you like about anybody except those two and me. Then, said Claudius, I shall talk about myself, and at some considerable length. I've made up my mind to it, and it's your fault. She lowered her voice and looked mischievous. Do you think, Mr. Sandal, that you ought to neglect that quite nice lady on your other side all through dinner? Oughtn't you to give her some of it? They laughed again. Not at all. She's very busy telling Mr. Severn all about herself. She doesn't wait for any caramel puddings. And as he knows a great deal more about her than she does, he's amused and she's interested. It would be brutal to interrupt them. Very well. Why are you going to Guildbridge? The moment that Angela had said that she was going down into the country, Claudius had decided also to go down into the country. To know that she was going to Guildbridge was to know that he was also going there. He had changed all his plans, suddenly, gladly, without the slightest hesitation, and now he was asked why. Why was he going? He hardly knew. He was a little dazed, like a man who is suddenly wakened from sleep and with his eyes half-closed vaguely feels that it is a glorious morning. But he knew, quite clearly, that the reason, whatever it was, was not one that could be told, now at any rate. I think London's at its worst in the hot weather. 
I've been to Guildbridge before, had the quaintest lodgings there. It's so jolly to be near the river in the summer. Most lodgings are quaint, said Angela meditatively. The people who let them have always had more bereavements than other people, and everything looks too clean at the beginning of the season, and too dirty all the rest of the time. And the furniture is of a type. Our rooms at Guildbridge are of the normal hideousness, I believe, but they look out over the heath. You know it. Ah, it's lovely, that heath. They talked on the heath of boating, of riding, of many things, not more seriously than a dinner-table permits, but just a little confidentially, happy in a kind of tacit understanding that each pleased the other. Ah, said Claudia suddenly, the moment has come. It is exactly half-past the caramel pudding. Yes, Angela answered, that is the time by your plate, but your plate is a little fast. Miss Witcherly, said Claudius, you may think that I eat too quickly. You may regret it. But you really can't mention it. Not to me. You're now going to talk about yourself. I only said I might. There's nothing to say to. Oh, yes, why did you say that I was like my first name? How could you even know that I had a first name? As for the last question, I may answer that I conjectured it. I do these brilliant things at times. But listen, you said that I was like my first name. Now my first name is Laura. Ah! What did you think it was? Angela. She had wanted to hear how it sounded when he said it. She had just what she wanted, and straight away blushed slightly. It is Angela, really, but I wouldn't be discontented with paradise or tired of it if only I could find it. Does anybody ever find it? I haven't. Some do. Don't look at the girl opposite to you, because I'm going to talk about her. Know her? No. Her name's Eva Murray. And of no importance. To look at, she's pretty but commonplace. I noticed her a few minutes ago. I grant you the commonplace. Well, most of the time her face has had the usual expression, the expression that a woman puts on with the powder for social purposes. But I caught her just now at a moment when she was neither talking nor listening. She allowed herself a moment's absent-mindedness. Her story seemed to come up into her eyes. Her face was transfigured, ecstatic and pathetic. It only lasted a moment, and it was not very becoming. Made her look seven years older. She was quite right to change it for that metallic, insincere brightness. But none the less, if we were in possession of Miss Murray's private history, we should find a paradise period in it. Really, Miss Witcherly? If you can tell as much as that from a momentary change of expression, I shall be very much afraid of you. Suppose, for instance, that you were to guess all my horrible past. One can only guess such things vaguely and occasionally. I... I don't think you've had a horrible past, but... She stopped short. Well... Isn't it quite absurd that we should have a fog at this time of year? I call it perfectly preposterous. Perfectly? Well, you had a sentence to finish. I am not quite sure how I was going to finish it. You must let me think. At that moment, the matronly lady on the other side secured Claudius. Now, Mr. Sandal, I haven't seen you for an age, and when we do meet, you don't talk to me. Ah, said Claudius, Mrs. Severn has given me no chance. A selfish man, I'm afraid, Lady Dunwich. Very nicely put. On a French model, I should say. Now, do you know anything about guinea pigs? I am most anxious to find out about them, and Mr. Severn knows nothing. My daughter Ella, you remember the child, keeps them, or I should say did keep them. There were thirteen. They died at intervals. I mean, they died one after another, beautifully kept, died perfect, everything all right, and yet they died. So very annoying. Oh, poor Ella. Can you explain it? It looks to me like foul play. It is mysterious, even romantic. Has Ella an enemy? Had the guinea pigs an enemy? You really suggest the most horrible things. You don't think a good vet... Oh, his evidence would be useful. You grant the police detectives the vengeance of the law. But, Mr. Sandal, I assure you I do not. I refuse positively to go to the law about anything. 
I am not going to stand up in a public witness box with a young man in a foolish wig paid to be impertinent to me. The hostess was already making her preparations for departure when Claudius got free from Lady Dunwich and turned again to Angela. You have a moment in which to finish that sentence. Please do it. You do not think I have a horrible past, but... It's only a conjecture. You'll laugh at it, I think. I'm inclined to think you have some... something very important at stake just now. She rose with the rest of the women. She had dropped a glove. Claudius picked it up, saying as he gave it to her, No, I am not ashamed at your conjecture. It is right. Then followed what seemed to Claudius a waste of time. The man who chatted with him over the coffee thought him slightly absent-minded, as indeed he was. The days of the octave had suddenly acquired a value for him, far beyond the value of material luxury and enjoyment. Plans formed themselves rapidly, one after another, in his mind. When the men entered the drawing-room afterwards, Angela Witcherly wondered what Claudius would do. She did not want him to come and talk to her just at first. He did not. She saw him go up to Lady Verrider and chat with her for a few moments. Then, at his request, Lady Verrider took him up to Mrs. Witcherly and presented him to her. Claudius was not always reckless. He could do wise things at times. Mrs. Witcherly found him delightful. He had known their old friend Mr. Burnage at Cambridge. She was the soul of indiscretion, and he heard with a flickering smile that Angela had refused Burnage. On the question of her own health, however, Mrs. Witcherly showed what was for her an unusual reticence. But he understood that she was a sufferer and was quite sympathetic. He was mildly amazed to find that this was the mother of Angela, but he recognized that she really had the good heart of which Lady Verrider had spoken. She spoke of her daughter, Angela, with pride, but slightly concealed, and told stories of her childhood. The wayward Angela had had rather a naughty childhood. Mrs. Witcherly was expecting to have a few friends at her house on the following evening, the Sunday evening. She wondered many things and apologized too much, but Claudius was delighted and said that he would come. Mrs. Witcherly was equally delighted to find that he was going to Guildbridge. He was so considerate, so interesting, had such a pleasant manner. She decided to find out more about him from Lady Verrider. She glanced across at her daughter, Angela, and for the moment her imagination ran riot. The drawing-room gradually emptied. Lady Dunwich and several other guests were going on to a dance. Mrs. Witcherly began to be a little uneasy. The hired brougham, it was never less than that when she dined with great wealth or slight title, had not come, and was already twenty minutes late. It was not the first time that he had defected. Claudius crossed the room and sat down beside Angela. I have been making your mother ask me for tomorrow night, he said. It was very good of her. It was kind of you, said Angela demurely. Yes, he said, smiling. I am never unnecessarily severe with myself, Miss Witcherly. May I say how glad I shall be to meet you again? I think we have some explanations. Yes, she said, looking down. We have, and yet... Well, you must not think that my unfortunately right guess compels you at all to tell me anything that you would rather not tell. Nor to believe that it would be of the least interest to you? Mamma is going, I see. Good night, Mr. Sandal. She gave him her pretty hand. And, she hesitated a little, it would interest me. Mrs. Witcherly wished to know if she might have a cab called, a four-wheeler, please. For some reason or other her brougham had not come, and it was really most annoying. One moment, Mrs. Witcherly, said Claudius. My carriage is waiting, and I shall not be going yet for some little time. It would be pleased and proud if you would allow it to take you and your daughter home, and then come back for me. Mrs. Witcherly was infinitely obliged. It was very kind of Mr. Sandal, and really... If it was not giving trouble, she thought she would. Reassured on this point, and with her hand warmly shaken, she and Angela departed. Son of Sir Constantine Sandal, she thought to herself, keeps his own carriage and is a very charming young man, obviously much attracted by Angela. Ah, if it could only be, the poor lady had given up hoping much. To her feminine and most intimate friends and contemporaries, she hid frankly that Angela simply would not look at a man. 
Lady Verida, Geoffrey Severn, and Claudius are left together. I say, Jane, said Geoffrey, if you've gone with me now, I've got a sort of half appointment at the club. You might come there too, Sandal. You may go, said Lady Verida. You've behaved very nicely, and I'm very grateful to you. Shan't let you take Claudius, though, because I want him myself. Good night, Geoffrey, and thanks again. When they were alone, Lady Verider went to the fireplace, rested an arm on the mantel place, and glazed into a quaint Venetian mirror. Her back was turned on Claudius as she spoke. Well, Claudius, I am not blind. I have eyes and see. I don't want you to tell me what you think of my Angela. I know. What difference does it make? The future is not in my own hands. Nothing can alter that after next Saturday. You mean that seriously? Yes. I would give worlds to know what hideous trouble you have gotten yourself into. I have been a friend to you since you were a baby, and you tell me next to nothing. Why do you stop at a hotel, and why don't you stop here with me? Why should I lose your confidence? She stamped her foot impatiently. My dear lady, you have not lost my confidence in the very slightest. I should be very glad to accept your hospitality but my plans are changed. I am going into the country on Monday. Are you going to the Wycherleys on Sunday night? Yes. Is it to Guildbridge that you are going on Monday? Yes. Knowing that she will be there? Yes. Lady Verider turned around and faced him. Claudius, my good friend, I am going to speak to you very plainly. There is a chance that the girl may get fond of you. I think she will. And then? and then you suddenly leave her without a word, pass out of her life, drop her, leave her humiliated and puzzled? You cannot do that. I do not think there is much chance of what you say, but I propose to tell her as soon as I decently can, at least as much as I have told you. Your intimacy with her seems to have progressed sufficiently rapidly. I know that you cannot do anything dishonourable. I have the utmost faith in you, but you are human, a man and not a god. And she is human. Poor, pretty Angela. You may explain to her that you cannot marry, but that will not prevent the chance that she may fall in love with you. And, said Claudius, rising, I am unwilling to risk on so slight a chance the utmost happiest I have ever had. Do I not speak frankly to you now? The days are so few that are left to me. Trust me a little further. I hope the best, said Lady Verider. Women go by siege, man by assault. The days are few, certainly, and it is possible no harm may be done to her. But I am anxious. Tell me, she added, is this a money matter? No, dear lady, he said, money could not help me. I know your kindness, though, and do believe that I am very grateful for it. Good night. Good night, then, Claudius. Let me know if I can help you in any way, and in any case, write me. As he stepped away from his carriage into the hotel, he heard above the sound of the traffic, the clang and chime for many steeples. The first day of the octave was over. End of chapter 10 Read by Rich Burgess Chapter 11 of the Octave of Claudius This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter 11 Claudius slept ill and rose early. From his brief sleep, he had been awakened by a horrible dream. He dreamed that he saw the doctor's face bending over him. The eyes were wolfish and eager, the lips drawn back a little, the whole expression diabolical. He tried to speak, but could not. As the face came nearer, and the horror of it grew on him, he tried to raise his arms and thrust it away, but he was unable to move. Then he awoke. It had merely been ordinary and typical form of nightmare. Yet long after he was awake, something of his horror from his sleep haunted him for the first time a suspicion of the doctor and a dread of the future entered his mind he banished them at once as reasonless 
what the doctor required he told himself was an assistant absolutely devoted there might be experiments which would require constant watching night and day secrets that could be trusted only to one who first forfeited his right to use them for himself a thousand explanations occurred to him he had been told that he was to regard himself as a slave body and soul it had been said seriously and he must be prepared to accept it literally yet it was always possible that there had been in the doctor's use of the phrase much of that whimsical exaggeration which was habitual with him it seemed even probable and the suspicions vanished before the octave was over they were to return again after breakfast claudius chose the inexpensive pleasure of an aimless walk through the london streets he had much to think about his point of view had changed the doctor had been right in saying that a year of freedom was too long if it was to be one's last year much might happen in that time to bind one to earth and make the farewell bitter but eight days one day even one hour might also be too long it was little more than an hour that had made the change in claudius placed him in the position of one who with the strongest possible motor for living sees the end of life very very near he loved angela though he had seen her but once contenu wrote the awful gautier notre avis est que si l'on n'aime pas une personne la première fois qu'on la voit il n'y a aucune raison pour l'aimer la seconde et encore moins la troisième if claudius had met angela but one hour before the doctors spoke of their strange contract that contract would never have been made if life meant angela then it would be worth while to undergo poverty sordid struggles many humiliations in order to live life would be then beyond price claudius saw now that among the many mingled causes which had resulted in the contract under which he was bound there was one which he had not suspected at the time yet in this tragic position he had no feeling of tragedy and no unhappiness he loved and it was enough true it seemed that the ordinary end of love was not for him but then no lover at first thinks of marriage or possession lady verrider's word of warning was vaguely in his mind the dim memory of one who was wise from her point of view he could not bring himself to think that angela would love him like that the nauseous vanity of such a supposition was insufferable he hoped that she would be kind to him and let him see her often on his part he knew that he was not free to he hated the banal words to make love to her dr gabriel lamb seemed a shadow and all the previous incidents of claudius life seemed obscure and unsubstantial when he thought of angela she was the light in the joy of thinking that for those few days he would often be with her he could forget that when those days were past he was to leave her for ever on one point he forced himself however to be clear doing this much justice to lady verrider he would take advantage of the strange guess that angela had made at dinner the night before to tell her everything he did not believe that in this point it mattered one straw whether he deceived her or not but all the same he would not deceive her she should know exactly how he stood until he met her he had decided not to tell any one the story of his contract with the doctor but if any one could possibly think that he ought to tell angela then he would tell her he would leave it for the night to settle how much and how little he should tell her then but certainly she should know all as soon as might be managed in the afternoon he went to gilbridge and took three rooms at the hotel there he returned and dined in town halfway through dinner it occurred to him 
that he would have preferred another wine but he did not commit the extravagance of ordering it of course he might have taken the entire hotel at gilbridge and ordered the entire wine list in london but perhaps one of the best proofs that it was not for the thousand pounds a day that he had sold himself was that he constantly forgot that he had a thousand pounds a day the doctor had strangely insisted on his side of the contract it had little or no interest for claudius mrs wycherley had not a thousand pounds a day but she had no doubt that her husband had been making money lately within the last fortnight he had in his mild and unpretentious way he had been practically gambling and gambling for far more than he could have afforded to lose it is a pity to have to record it because its effect may be deplorable on those if any who hear about it but mr wycherley had won having won he had decided not to gamble any more but to stick to his legitimate business he kept to that decision once only in his life did he sell shares which he did not possess in a mine which practically did not exist once only did he buy shares for which he would have been unable to pay from people who had not got them to sell these two speculations although they may not look promising when stated boldly put money into mr wycherley's pocket and left him quite satisfied that dabbling in mines was a dangerous business and he must never touch it again he did not tell his wife any of this he did not want to make her anxious besides in matters masculine and commercial jessica did not know anything about anything and explanations were tedious but still she noticed things mr wycherley one day tasted the party champagne on inquiry he found that he had six dozen of it he sent that six dozen off to a hospital remarking dryly that it ought to be drunk in some place where the doctors were handy also he thought that after all he might as well have some wine that he could drink himself and he ordered that wine then again he suddenly discovered that the house needed to be redecorated jessica and angela were to go to gilbridge while it was being done and jessica might have those oxford street people she was always thinking about to do it no he wouldn't go to gilbridge himself when a man leaves his business his business leaves him besides there ought to be somebody in the house to keep an eye on the workmen mrs wycherley was delighted things are looking up in the city then she said we get along somehow he answered with a sigh it was his invariable reply to that question he would not let mrs wycherley keep her own carriage be reasonable jessica in people in our position that would be ostentatious mrs bodgers jessica began bodgers by the way had joined mr wycherley in that speculation bodgers is a fool a fair judge of port but in many ways sadly wanting in discretion no you may have that hired broom sometimes well pretty often you can fetch me from the office at five now and then if you like the first time that mrs wycherley and angela fetched him from the office he inquired of them vaguely what's the name of the place where you get your clothes they suggested several places ah said mr wycherley this is more comfortable than the bus mustn't do it every day though then he relapsed into silence but presently he added i don't like your clothes angela and i don't like your mother's either we'll go and get some more on this occasion he was wildly generous insisting on bond street and the best of everything on the next afternoon he came back on the bus though and not to make a penny fare into tuppence walked the last quarter of a mile mrs wycherley had a few people to dinner that night and the invaluable jameson assisted after dinner jameson retired to the basement and spoiled a previously immaculate career 
by getting drunk on about equal parts of kitchen beer and upstairs curacao he did not appear again fortunately until the guests were gone and then he attempted to leave the house surreptitiously that is to say he took off his coat folded it neatly over his arm opened his umbrella and came up into the hall here he paused possibly to add some further touches to the disguise and was discovered by mr wycherley mr wycherley had been inquiring the reason for jameson's absence and had been told by a euphemistic parlour-maid that mr jameson had come over very strange in this manner mr wycherley was in fact looking for jameson mr wiley said jameson with dignity i know your family many years and i'm man as likes to shee everything tidy round bout me everything quite tidy and then i'm i'm as i, I ought to be he lowered himself into one of the hall chairs you'll excuse me for speaking burr when things are understood then they're they're ash they ought to be and everything ought to be ash it ought with which remarks on the comial foe jameson immediately fell asleep he was removed from the house in a four-wheeled cab and he never returned to it mrs wycherley aghast and much upset said she was deeply and truly thankful that this shocking scene had not taken place when the guests were still there mr wycherley said get a permanent man jessica good but not too expensive get him to-morrow it was the crowning extravagance it was this permanent and perfect person who hovered at the doors of mrs wycherley's salon when claudius entered claudius generally self-possessed felt himself almost trembling with excitement to-night he could not however see angela at first mrs wycherley breaking in waves on a black velvet chore shook his hand and was so glad she handed him on to a clever girl in the wrong pink with the smudgy complexion that almost always goes with much soul she talked vivaciously and so did claudius the buzz of conversation around them made most of their remarks inaudible to each other but neither minded it much as claudius was talking he caught a glimpse of angela she was standing at some distance away in the window and an undersized young man with yellow hair and a make-up tie was openly and rather nervously adoring her he was one of the world's understudies and there were many of them there however lady verrider had almost promised to come and bring her title mrs wycherley did not despair of the evening's brilliancy angela was in white satin and silver and the dress had cost a great deal of money she was feeling quite all right about herself as far as appearance went but her eyes were sad and thoughtful she knew that claudius was in the room had glanced once rapidly at him found him looking intently at her and not dared to glance again until she heard his voice and he was shaking hands with her may i be introduced to nobody and talk to you all the rest of the evening said claudius thy servant is the daughter of the house she said and has duties which i am sure mrs wycherley performs to perfection has the daughter of the house also had supper angela rose put her hand under his arm and the two joined the stream flowing supperwards isn't that a charming dress said angela i mean the lady right over there in the corner i should have thought so you must think so i've seen one i admired more which what colour if my audacity may be forgiven white and silver oh yes it's pretty i tried to dress like an angel and i've come out like a wedding cake i didn't dare to go into supper before for fear someone would cut a slice i will protect you me no protect them think of their disappointment it's true though those that go often to dances and things always become gradually exactly like some dish in a ball supper their dresses are no longer trimmed 
they're garnished their expressions alter too yet creamy like a mayonnaise luscious like a macedoine virulent like a boar's head patient and vacuous like a cold fowl every chaperone looks like a cold fowl i know one of them will get carved by accident one of these days their talk at supper time was not much more serious angela was happy bewitching and in rather mad spirits apparently she introduced claudius maliciously to several people she had a way of making others fall into her mood many dull and heavy people sprang into wit at her end of the table that night and wondered when they got home with approving wonder at the things they themselves had said afterwards claudius took angela out on to the balcony here striped canvas made a sweet seclusion for two lounge chairs a tiny table a shaded lamp and a potted palm well he said and now we're out of the crowd my crowd please poor little struggling crowd i must go back to it soon before you go i have something to tell you she leaned right back in her chair a graceful creature her pretty white hand playing with her ivory fan her eyes had grown sad again almost plaintive under the long lashes her red lips had lost their garb of raillery yes she said you have but there is one thing tell me nothing if you would rather not we met by chance i guessed something by chance i ought not to have guessed shall we leave it it would be kind of you if you would let me tell you yes then tell me i'm interested i guessed that you had something of importance at stake and why should i not say it i have thought a great deal about it since have you he said eagerly have you no doubt it is chiefly important to myself but it is more important to myself than i thought once by a promise given a contract made after a few days i become body and soul the property of another man his to kill or to keep alive his to do just as he likes with his utterly until one or other of us dies there was a moment's silence angela's eyes were wide open you astonish me she said it's an airy story i cannot understand it is literally true yes that of course but i do not understand how it happened how it could happen the story is long i don't want you to think too badly of me when i gave my promise i thought i thought i was right i'm sure enough now god knows that i was wrong it is a long story but if you have the patience to hear it i will tell it you angela rose from her chair and clasped her hands she was thinking i cannot hear it now she said because we must go back i'm not quite sure whether i want you to tell me it or not that has nothing to do with patience or interest of course i am interested it is all so strangely romantic my possible reason for not hearing it would be be different did you not say that you expected to be at gilbridge tomorrow your mother has promised to bring you to dine with me at my hotel that night i'm hoping to see you very often i wonder why you spend your last days there no don't tell me not now perhaps one day at gilbridge i shall ask you for the whole story will you tell it me then yes whenever you wish it you have given me the impression that you are a lonely man and sometimes that you are unhappy i ought to be unhappy i do not think i am strangely enough i want she faltered quickly and suddenly to give you my sympathy she stretched out both hands and he held them for a second her face had grown pale she looked to him unspeakably beautiful he checked an impulse and they passed back into the crowded room together a formal farewell followed on his way home he felt glad that he had not made love to angela wycherley better men have had similar illusions after all the guests had gone mrs wycherley had a talk with angela 
we met him last night said mrs wycherley with fat gaiety and again to-night and we're to dine with him to-morrow and he means to see us often at gilbridge he tells me i'm sure i don't know what it means perhaps you could tell me my dear angela sat down beside her mamma dear she said i'm going to be serious what is it at last to-night mr sandell told me something of his private affairs he will not and cannot marry then why i wish to see a good deal of him during the next few days i am grown up you must trust me completely yes darling angela i do trust you but is this right in him and is it is it dear for your own happiness yes i think so the circumstances are strange you know me mamma dear and you trust me that is sweet of you leave this to me and don't ask me any more questions now i will tell you all one day if mr sandell lets me and i am sure he will my dear this is terribly upsetting i wonder no i won't ask any questions of course he does not make love to you don't say those words mamma dear i do hate them so no no he has not she honestly believed it better women have had similar illusions mrs wycherley allowed herself to be persuaded on every point in her heart she supposed that there was but some temporary obstacle exaggerated by angela's imagination and that although angela might not think it now she would yet be happily married to claudius sandell end of chapter 11 recording by john brandon